My name is Susan Rogers. I'm a professor in the Department of Music Production and Engineering and also Liberal Arts at Berklee College of Music in Boston. I started in the music industry in 1978 in Southern California in Hollywood. I wanted to be a record maker, not a musician, but a record maker in some capacity as an engineer uh, or maybe as a mixer. I started uh, as a studio maintenance technician. I worked for a company called Audio Industries Corporation in Hollywood. They're not there anymore, but during the uh, 70s and 80s, Audio Industries sold MCI, consoles and tape machines. So I was in the service department and I learned to repair consoles and tape machines and installing studios, doing wiring and things like that. That was very good training for me. Um, it's not to say that they trained me on everything. I studied. I studied really hard to learn electronics and acoustics and magnetism. Uh, but that's how I got my start. I worked for a studio called Rudy Records that belonged to Crosby, Stills & Nash from 1981 until 1983. And then in August of 1983, I was hired by Prince. I was a big Prince fan. I heard he was looking for a technician. So my dream came true and I went to work for Prince in August of 1983. It was Prince who put me in the engineering chair and allowed me to engineer with him from Purple Rain through Sign of the Times and the Black Album. As soon as, I, as Prince gave me the chance to be an engineer, I took that chance because of course it was more artistic and um, it allowed for more self-expression, although technical work is very, very creative if you're doing it well, because you're solving really difficult problems. But being an engineer means you're solving a different kind of problem. Uh, mixing is a different kind of problem from engineering. And then producing is something else that's even different from both of those. So fortunately for me, uh, anytime I would be asked to do a new job, whether it was engineering or mixing or producing, I'd always say yes, just to see how well I could do. And of course, I'm not very good as a beginner, nobody is, but if you have a taste for it and you realize, if I keep doing this, I'll get better, uh, everything I tried, I was willing to keep trying as long as people would let me to see how good I could get at it and, and if I can make a contribution. Each one of those jobs requires something different from inside of you. Um, engineers manipulate sound like a cameraman on a film or TV manipulates the picture, the amount of light that comes in, the amount of shadow. Producers manipulate performance like a director on a film. And mixers are a little bit of both, as well as being a little bit of uh, like an orchestra conductor, deciding where the listener's attention is going to go. So all of those things are, are doable, but they're all slightly different. When I worked with Prince, um, the mix was always taking shape as the song was being recorded. So Prince didn't do what most people do. Most people record a basic track, and then another basic track, and then another one, and then they choose on a different day which song they're going to do overdubs on. They'll overdub on a song for a few days, and then they send it to someone else to be mixed uh, on a different day. When I worked with Prince, it was a smooth transition from the beginning tracks, the drums, the bass, the rhythm instruments, the melodic instruments, um, the vocals, the backing vocals, uh, the additional percussion. As all these things were coming together while he was playing the instruments, I or uh, Peggy McCreary or whichever engineer he was working with can be dialing in the sounds. So that by the time he's finished with the last overdub, we were pretty close to having a finished mix if we had had enough time to dial sounds in. So it kind of transitioned there. Uh, it was after I left Prince at the end of 1987, that's when I moved back to Hollywood and I began working the way the rest of the world works, where you'd be hired to be just a mixer or hired to be just an engineer. The first time I was asked to produce a record was uh, 1991. I had been independent for about three years 
and I was asked by the label to co-produce a record with a band. Um, so I would be engineering it, but the band did not have a producer, and I was asked to uh, be an advisor. And that was my first taste of production. So I did a little bit of that for a couple of albums, co-production with the band. Uh, once I got a taste of it, um, I realized that co-production is really difficult. It's like having two people drive a car. It just is much better to have one person drive the car. I liked engineering for other producers like Tony Berg, Matt Wallace, T-Bone Burnett, Phil Ramone. I mean, it's a joy to work with other producers as an engineer. But when I was asked to produce, I always engineered the records that I produced because at this point I could engineer um, very, very easily. I didn't have to think about it. Uh, so I, while, while I produced, I would also engineer. When I was uh, about 44, 45 years old, I made the decision that I would like to try a different kind of life. I would enjoy very much the work of a scientist. Uh, it had been calling me for about 10 years. Uh, for about 10 years, I began to feel like, I think I would enjoy working in a laboratory. I think I would enjoy exploring the natural world. Just the questions of science. I didn't have a clear picture of what science I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to um, do investigative work in the sciences. I thought that I would enjoy that. I didn't have a college degree. I had never been to college before. But once I had a hit record with Bare Naked Ladies in 1998, I had enough money that I could quit my job and go to college and earn a bachelor's degree. So that's what I did. I went to the University of Minnesota. I had a dual major. I majored in psychology and in neuroscience. Um, and then immediately after getting my bachelor's degree, I realized I wanted to study music cognition, music perception. So again, I was lucky. I get lucky a lot in my life. But I was lucky again to get into the laboratory of Daniel Levitin at McGill University. Dan Levitin wrote, This is Your Brain on Music. So I got into his laboratory in 2004, and that year he decided to write his book. Music cognition is the science of what our brain is doing when we're listening to music, when we're deciding what we like and what we don't like, music preferences, when we're feeling something from music, when we are performing music or writing music, um, it looks at what do babies know about music and when do they know it? What are humans born knowing and what do we have to learn? Uh, what do all the cultures of the world have in common musically and what's different among them? How do we perceive pitch and timbre? And how do we know where an object is in space? So that's all music cognition and it includes music perception, uh, topics like uh, the, how hearing works and how the auditory pathway works. So anyway, I've enjoyed this line of inquiry. I got into Dan's lab at McGill, and I did four years there and earned my PhD in uh, under, studying with Daniel Levitin and also studying with uh, Stephen McAdams. Stephen McAdams may be known to, well, he's well known to scientists in France because he was at IRCAM for 27 years. After I earned my PhD, I received an offer to join the faculty at Berkeley College of Music, and they made me a very tempting offer. They said, you can teach your new discipline, music cognition, psychoacoustics, you can write science courses for us, but you can also teach your former profession of engineering and production. And it was, uh, that, was a, that was a very tempting offer, that was a good deal. The great thing about working as a professor at Berkeley is that it's a music college. So we've got 5,000 young musicians from all over the world. There's no other college like it in the world. 5,000 musicians engaged in all manner of contemporary music study, music business, music education, music therapy, film scoring, sound design, uh, jazz composition, songwriting majors, as well as engineering majors and record production majors. So I see students who've worked very hard to get into this college and who um, are all musicians and uh, we talk about music all day long. When you're producing a record or uh, engineering it, you're really thinking about art 
And you're thinking about how uh, what you're hearing is making you feel. Is it working or isn't it? You're listening to the signal coming out of the speakers and you're comparing it with the signal that's in your head. Here's what I hear. Here's what I want to be hearing. <laughs> What's the difference <laughs> between those two things? So there's not really much room to be thinking about psychology or science. But every once in a while, a little bit of understanding of music cognition can help you. For example, most human beings who are right-handed or left-handed process music in the right hemisphere of the brain. And most people process language, speech, in the left hemisphere of the brain. When a person is singing, singing is music, so it comes from the right, but a lot of it comes from the left, our speech centers. Now, any, um, the, the, the body's system crosses over so that information that comes into your left ear goes mostly to the right side. Information that comes in the right ear goes mostly to the left side. And then it goes, of course, to the whole brain. But in general, in general, if a sound is coming in your right ear, this is usually where we hold our phones, right ear, it goes right here to where speech is processed. But if we put our phone in the other hand and put it here, it's going to go here where emotion is processed. A little bit more, a little bit more. So what I was listening to today in the control room was that Tommy was singing and playing guitar, but because he was focusing so much on his singing, he wasn't paying much attention to playing guitar. And I wanted him, instead of having so much emphasis on what he was saying, I wanted him to think about what he was feeling in his fingers. So I thought, well, just maybe if I put a hear an earphone just here in his left ear, most of what he's hearing is going to be coming from here. And it might change his playing. I didn't have a chance to, to try it out. We used a different tactic. But there are things you can do with a little bit of knowledge of music cognition. Another thing you can do as an engineer is you will know immediately um, how to adjust a compressor to help us um, manipulate the listener's attention. If things are not changing, if they're all compressed and evened out and not changing, we can ignore it more easily, put it in the background of our minds, and then we'll focus on the things that are changing. So sometimes I want a compressor because I want a sound to just be in the background, and other times I want to take that compressor off so that the sound can keep grabbing my attention. That is informed by music cognition. Things uh, that, that are informed by psychoacoustics include uh, when frequencies are covering each other up, when you want them to separate and when you want them to blend. There are, there's, it's good to have a dialogue between the science and the art of music, both aspects. It's good. So today we're recording two musicians who've known each other a long time and they've played together a long time. So we have Tommy Jordan from California and we have Vincent Segal from Paris. And Vincent is playing cello, Tommy's playing guitar and singing. These two musicians are both very intuitive and they are driven more by intuition than they are by technique. But both of these musicians are very well trained. Tommy went to Oberlin College in Ohio for, for a film, or rather music composition. Vincent has had much, much formal classical music training. But their goal when they work together is to look for something that is beyond training and is something about the raw nature of what music is. So they try to throw out the rule book and look for what they can discover about music and musical expression. So when you're working with artists who think like that, the goal is to go very fast, get their sounds as fast as you possibly can, and get them comfortable. And then what the producer wants to do and what the engineer wants to do is listen to them listening. They're listening to each other, and they're responding to each other. Beginning musicians don't listen very well. They play, but they don't hear. And they learn their parts, they learn how to play, but they don't always learn how to hear because these musicians have been playing for so many years, they don't worry about playing very much. They're mostly worried 
about can I come up with the right ideas? So we listen for them listening to each other, and when we think that we hear something that's good, we want to keep encouraging them and telling them, yes, keep that, keep that, this isn't working, this is working. It's a dance of ears. <laughs> it's a dance of, of ears, not feet. It's what we know about um, how listening makes us feel. Um, it's hard to put into words, but if you can hear something that feels good, you probably have something good, and then you can build on that. It's a little bit like making music the way a new chef would make a new sauce. I know it's going to be a tomato sauce, so I'm going to use these tomatoes, but after that, I don't know. I'll try this herb, this spice, that herb, this flavor, and I keep tasting, tasting, tasting. Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? We're, we're seeking, we're looking for something to see what it is. And we have confidence we're going to find something because we have the right ingredients and the right knowledge of knowing it when we hear it. The way we would work with other musicians is we would start by listening to the song, which is the chord changes, the melody, and the lyrics. And then the producer and the artist would discuss stylistically what's the best style for this song. Here are the chord changes, here's the melody, here's the lyrics. Stylistically, what would be best? Well, to answer that question, you have to ask, in your career, what do you want this song to do for you? So the form of the song must serve the function. The function might be, I want to be a big pop star. Or the function might be, I want to experiment to find my style. Or the function might be, I want to um, do a great video. Once you decided what your goal is, how you want this record to work for you, then you say, okay, if this is our goal, here's how we're going to get there. Here's our tactic. We're going to use drum machine, or we're going to program the drums, or we're going <clears> to <throat> use acoustic drums. It's going to be keyboard bass, or it's going to be electric bass, acoustic bass. It's going to be this instrumentation. It's going to be this tempo. We're going to listen to the key. Where, it, where does the song sit in your voice? Does it need to be a higher key, a lower key? So you make all these decisions about the formal structure to serve the function in the artist's career. In the case of the record we're doing today, there's no record label. These uh, gentlemen, these musicians are older. They don't have to prove anything to anybody. So today the function is, let's see what we can discover. Let's see what we have. It's like a chef, again, in the kitchen saying, I want to invent a new sauce. Let me play around. I don't have to open a restaurant. I don't have to please the critics. I want to make a discovery. So this is a different kind of record making than most, certainly than most young people would do. Uh, but it's, uh, young people should remember that there are many, many, many ways of making a record, many ways. And keep your eyes open, keep your mind open, keep your ears open, and you'll learn from the different producers in different situations uh, how, how record making is done. The lesson to be learned from today's session is to learn how to pull music from people. The music you make isn't something that you go looking for out there in the world and then when you spot it, or like, say you have an idea, you, you don't just go and pull it off a tree. Music doesn't come from outside you. Music comes from inside you. So the producer's job is to take whatever music is in a person at any given day and time and pull it out. You have to be able to judge how good the person can be in any given situation. So let's say if a singer is having a bad day and they're not singing very well, you have to realize the vocal is not going to be very good today. I'm going to push her up to this point, but she stops here. So I'm going to push her here, and if I keep pushing her, she's going to fall, and we won't get, we won't get anything. So when you can hear that a musician like Vincent 
on his instrument is a virtuoso, he's great, you can give him any idea and he'll be able to play it, any idea. But Tommy on guitar is not the same musician because Tommy uses guitar to write. So I can't tell Tommy, do this on guitar, do this on guitar, do this, because it's not who Tommy is. Um, it's important for young producers to learn how to measure or find the boundaries of a musician's ability and push them to do, give their best work in those boundaries. Now, Tommy is a much better singer than he is guitar player. If we do a vocal later this afternoon, I'm really going to push him vocally because he can do it. Um, this is, uh, it's, it's important for students to watch because they may be thinking, well, that wasn't very good. How come she doesn't, how come she's praising him for that? That wasn't very good. It's because that instrument stopped there, and I'm going to let another instrument take over. Where that instrument stopped, another instrument is going to take over and fill in the gaps of where that one stopped. We're always thinking, uh, when we listen to music coming together, what's good about it? Was the melodic idea good? Was the harmony good? Was the, was the rhythm good? Or maybe just the expression was good. It wasn't in the pocket, but it had feeling. Uh, we're always listening for what's good about it and, uh, and hoping we get as much of good stuff as possible before the day is done. Sound serves music the way colors serve vision, a scene. So you go to a movie, you might get annoyed if the movie, the cinema, is too bright or too dark. But most of the time you're going to forget about it and you're just going to get caught up in the story and the performances. Um, it's the same thing with manipulating sound frequencies. We want them to be as good as possible, but sometimes a movie scene calls for it to be dark, and sometimes a movie scene calls for it to be bright, and sometimes everything, the difference between the, uh, the shadow and the light should be very sharp, and sometimes it should be blurred. That's the sound engineer's job, is to decide how the sound is complementing what the music, the musical scene, is saying. Remember that the lyrics are the script and the director is responsible for deciding how to frame the story that we're seeing. So imagine, and I, I told the students this when I did the workshop, let's say we have a scene in a movie, a man and a woman and they're fighting husband and wife, a young husband and wife, and they're fighting, and it's a serious fight. And the actors are going to read the words, the script that they've memorized. How do you want to frame that shot? Should it be a close-up on their faces? His face, her face, his face, her face, back and forth. What does the viewer get from face, 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 face? That's one way. You can pull the camera back and show them from the upper part of the body, you see the two of them facing each other, talking. The viewer gets a different impression. Or you can move the camera back and show the two people in their apartment with the pictures of their wedding and the pictures of their children and the view outside their window. That shows the apartment. This is what's at stake. Here's what they will lose if they break up. Or you can move the camera around. The cameraman and the director work together to decide how to frame the shot for the most emotional impact and to help propel the story forward. Is it a big scene in the movie or is it not an important scene? Maybe they're not fighting, fighting. Maybe it's just a little argument because there's tension. Same thing for the producer and the engineer. Are we going to go for a dry, intimate sound? That gives the listener one impression. A big roomy sound, a different impression. Is this an important song on the album that tells mostly the story we want to say? Or is it, no, it's just a fun song. So the producer has to understand the big picture of the listener's experience. What will the listener know about these artists from hearing this music? What will this music do for the artist's career? It will make people think that they're good at this. Maybe they don't worry so much about that. Where are these artists positioned? Where is this record positioned? Those things, um, 
We don't talk about them too much when we talk about album making or music making. We should. It's no different from making television or film. It's a story. It's a musical story. But the technical decisions we make can change the impact of the story and make it work or make it not work. Trust me, I know, a bad mix of a good song will ruin that good song. Now, I did say, people buy the music, not the sound, but bad sound can pull down good music, just like bad editing in a film or bad uh, framing of the scene can make the viewer say, I don't understand what's happening here. I don't understand this movie. Uh, the devil is in the details. All the little details need to come together when you make music, like when you make movies, I'm sure, or write books. All the details must come together.